Welcome back. This is a deeper dive into Module 2, and this exercise is optional, but I'm hoping it'll give you a little bit more insight into the materials we've covered so far. This will be more informal than previous segments, which means I will be saying um a lot more, but it will actually give you a little bit better um, idea of what my actual classes are like. And so what we will be doing are a couple different calculations that I've called out in different segments. We'll first talk about scientific notation, which is a tool we need in order to do all the calculations between 2.4 and 2.7. So let's get started. The first thing we need to talk about is scientific notation. Scientific notation is a way of being able to talk about very large numbers and to be able to write them out compactly. Scientific notation is taking advantage of our brain's ability to see small numbers quickly. So if I, let's say I throw a bunch of rocks on the ground, if it's a handful, you'll be able to be like, oh, that's five rocks. But if I throw a ton of them, you actually have to start counting. And so, for example, if I want to ask, what is the mass of Earth in kilograms? That's the mass of Earth in kilograms, right? And you actually have to count all of those zeros up. Scientific notation allows us to write this quickly. So in scientific notation, the mass of the Earth is 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms, where 24 is counting up all of those zeros. There are 24 zeros there. For example, if I want to ask what's the mass of the moon, the mass of the moon is this number in kilograms. And if you compare the numbers, those big numbers between Earth and Moon, you might almost say that the mass of the Moon is bigger looking at all of those zeros. In scientific notation, it's really quick. So 7 point whatever times 10 to the 22nd kilograms, we see that 24 is bigger than 22. And so we quickly know that the mass of Earth is much larger than the mass of the Moon. So scientific notation is critical, particularly when we're talking about rocket science and astrophysics in order to be able to write these numbers out in a way that our brain can handle. Okay, moving on, the first thing I want to introduce and talk about is Kepler's third law. So we've talked about this a couple times, now we're going to get all the details right. Kepler's law is equal to a cubed g over 4 pi squared p squared m. So let's go through each of these individually. So we've talked about A in previous segments. This is the semi-major axis. That is, it is the distance from the center of the object out to the, um, the ellipse. This is a new term that we haven't talked about before. These are the constants um, in order to get the numbers right. So g over 4 pi squared, 4 is a number, pi is a number, 3.14 something, something, something. g is also a number. I have to Google it every time, and so let's just do that. G is a constant, and it's 6.67. Ah, here we have some scientific notation. 10 to the minus 11, so that means that's a lot of zeros after a decimal point. This constant also has some letters after it. These are the units. So M is meters, kg is kilograms, and seconds. And so we'll also have to make sure that we're using the same un units throughout our calculations. All right, so those are the, the constants. Then we have the period of the orbit, that's how long it takes the object to go around. And then the mass of the Earth, which we just talked about in the last slide, uh, which we can look up in, again, the same units that we are using for our um, gravitational constant. So let's do an example. The first example that we talked about in segment 2.4 was Sputnik. And so Sputnik, again, was launched in 1957. It orbited the Earth every 96.2 minutes. So the question that I asked in that segment was, how high above the Earth's surface did Sputnik orbit? So let's get into that and ask, figure out that question. Whenever you're given a problem, it helps to be really organized. And so the first thing you might ask is, what is the stuff that we know? What are we given? And so let's just write those down very methodically. So we are given, or we know, Kepler's law. We are given the period of Sputnik, so that's 96.2 minutes. Some of the other things we know, so we know the mass of the Earth, and we know this gravitational constant. And so that's what we know. What are we asked for? We're asked for a distance. We're asked for the height above the Earth's surface. Okay, so 
let's do this calculation. We definitely need to figure out that distance, um, and so let's figure out that distance, um, the semi-major axis. So first, I'm going to write this out with some of the things I know. So now I first add the period P and the mass of the Earth. I then am going to add the gravitational constant, which sets all of the units. And so now I'm writing out all those numbers, but now I notice that the gravitational constant has seconds, the period as I've written it has minutes. So I need to make sure that the units are right and the same. So I'm going to change the minutes into seconds and do the full calculation. So I've checked my units. I multiply this out, and what I've done here is taken 96.2 minutes, multiplied essentially by one, so 60 seconds over one minute. And now I can make sure that all the units are right. And so I can cross out a unit if it's on the top of the equation and on the bottom of the equation. So watch this. So here I get rid of minutes on the top, minutes on the bottom. Here I get rid of seconds on the bottom, seconds on the top. And I get rid of kilograms on the bottom and on the top. Now I'm left with units of that m cubed, which is a distance, which I'm trying to calculate. So a cubed is equal to this number, 3 whatever times 10 to the 20th meters cubed. I can then take the cube root of both sides, and I'm left with a, the semi-major axis of Sputnik, was 7,000 kilometers. OK, that's close, but actually that's not quite what we wanted. The question was, how high above the Earth's surface is Sputnik? So I've now calculated the semi-major axis. But if I, let's say, zoom in on this a little bit, the semi-major axis is actually not the, the distance we want. It is the distance above the Earth's surface. And so what I actually want is that like little red part right there. Um, and what I need to do is take the semi-major axis A and subtract off the radius of the Earth. So I can look, at, look up the radius of the Earth. The height above the surface is A minus the radius of the Earth. 7,000 minus the radius, which is 6,400 kilometers. And so Sputnik's distance above the Earth is 600 kilometers. And as we said before, if we look up the definition of LEO, this was in low Earth's orbit. OK, so let's do another calculation. Moving on, in section 2.5, we calculated or we asked what was the um, orbital height of the International Space Station compared to the Hubble Space Telescope. So there's the International Space Station, there's Hubble. And the question again, same thing, was how high above the Earth's surface. So we can do the same calculation, different numbers. We were given the period of both of these objects. So the International Space Station orbits with 60, uh, sorry, with 93 minutes. Hubble a little bit longer, 95.4 minutes. So a minute and a half two minutes and a half uh, longer. Again, doing that same calculation, we've got the um, Kepler's third law. I put in the period on both sides and the mass of the Earth. I change my units and do the multiplication. On the International Space Station side, I figure out that the semi-major axis is 6,800 kilometers. On the Hubble Space Telescope side, again, I do that uh, calculation through. I get 9,000, sorry, 6,925 kilometers, so bigger. Now I have to subtract off the radius of the Earth. If I do that on the International Space Station, I get 400 kilometers. If I do that for the Hubble Space Telescope, I get 525 kilometers. So I put my red box around both of those. And you'll note again that even though the period of Hubble is only two minutes, a little bit more than two minutes longer, the difference in orbital height is substantial. It's up, you know, 125 kilometers, so almost 100 miles. OK, so coming back to my list, we've gone through Kepler's third law. We've gone through our Sputnik and ISS and Hubble Space Telescope example. Let's keep moving on. So also in segment 2.5, we talked about the orbital velocity in low Earth orbit. So let's actually calculate this for real. So the question was, how fast do LEO satellites travel? We'll do this for the Hubble Space Telescope. What is the velocity that Hubble is traveling in its orbit? So again, what are we given? So we're given Hubble's orbital period, so 95 and a bit minutes. 
I'll instantly just turn that into seconds, so 5,700 seconds. So I've just multiplied that by 60 seconds in a minute. We know Hubble's semi-major axis. We calculated that two slides ago, so 6,924 6, kilometers. And so now we want to get a velocity. Velocity is distance over time. Right, so that's the equation for velocity. And now we have most of that. Looking at Hubble's orbit, we've got the time, the orbital period. In order to get the distance that it travels in that time, we need the distance it travels in the time. That is, it's going around in that circle. What is the distance of that circle? The distance is gonna be the circumference. So how far does it travel in the orbit of 5,700 5, seconds? It's the circumference of the circle. Circumference of the circle is equal to 2 pi times the radius. In this case, we're going to assume a circular orbit, so 2 pi a. So now we have everything we need to do this calculation. OK, so here we go. Velocity is distance over time, which is equivalent to 2 pi a, the circumference, over the period. I put those values in. 2 pi times a, which was 6,925 kilometers, divided by the time of 5,700 seconds. Multiply that out, and I get 7.6 kilometers per second. Converting this just into a unit that I kind of have more intuition for, that's 17,000 miles per hour. And again, that is fast. So good. We've now calculated the velocity of a LEO satellite. Another thing that we talked about in segment 2.6 was the orbital period of a GPS satellite. So GPS satellites are off in medium Earth orbit. Let's calculate what the orbital period is. OK, so a typical medium Earth satellite, a typical GPS satellite, is orbiting at about 20,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. The question is, what is its orbital period? So again, what are we given? Well, we are given the semi-major axis. That is, we can take that 20,000 kilometers, add the Earth's radius. We're given the we can calculate the semi-major axis, 26,400 kilometers. We're also given Kepler's law, but we've only seen Kepler's law in this formulation. So a cubed equals p squared m with some constants. But we're asked for the orbital period. In order to get the orbital period, we need to manipulate this equation to solve for p, the orbital period. And so moving things around in this equation, I can also write Kepler's law as p squared equals 4 pi squared over g, a cubed over m. These are equivalent formulas. And I actually suggest, if you want to try and do this yourself, try and go from the first formulation to the second formulation to calculate p. But now we have a formula where we can calculate the orbital period. So now, what is the orbital period of a medium Earth orbit satellite? I can now plug some numbers in. So I have 4 pi squared. I can put in my gravitational constant g with all of its units. I have a cubed. And then I also have put in the mass of the Earth. So putting in the uh, or, uh, semi-major axis of 26,400 kilometers cubed, I can now do the math here, calculate this out, um, make sure I've got all my units correct. Sorry, I've got to make sure my units are correct. I had kilometers on the top for semi-major axis. The gravitational constant had meters. So I convert kilometers into meters. Meters I get rid of, kilometers I get rid of, and I'm left with a time. Calculating this out, I get p squared equals 2 times 10 to the ninth second squared. If I take the square root of both sides of this equation, 43,000 seconds or 12 hours. So that is the orbital period of a medium Earth's orbit satellite. And we'll note 12 hours is much longer than a LEO satellite where the uh, orbital period was an hour and a half. So LEO satellites closer to the Earth, shorter orbital periods. Medium Earth orbits are farther away, longer orbital periods. And so the last calculation that we will do for segment two was asking the orbital distance of a geosynchronous satellite. So now moving out even further, remember geosynchronous satellites are by definition something that has an orbital period of 24 hours, exactly matched to the orbital period of the Earth. 
And so what we can ask is, what is the semi-major axis? What is the orbital distance of a satellite in order to have an orbital period of 24 hours? So again, we'll start with Kepler's laws, and we will plug in 24 hours in order to calculate the distance. And so I've put in my gravitational constant, I put in 24 hours, I put in the mass of the Earth, I check my units, I note that I have seconds in the gravitational constant, but hours in my orbital period, so let's change 24 hours into seconds. So I'm changing my units. 24 hours, I know that in each hour there are 60 minutes, and in each minute there are 60 seconds. So 24 times 3,600 changes that into seconds. Multiply all of that out, and I get A cubed equals 7 and a bit times 10 to the 22nd meters cubed. I take the cube root of both sides. I get the semi-major distance of a geosynchronous satellite, but that's not quite what I want. I want the distance above the Earth's surface. And so I take that distance, I subtract the Earth's radius, and now I get the answer that we were looking for. So the height above the Earth's surface in order to have an orbital period of 24 hours is 35,600 kilometers. And we'll put a red box around that because that's what we wanted. Okay, so those are the calculations, sort of a little bit deeper dive into each of the things that we've talked about uh, in segment two. We will do another deeper dive for, as part of segment three, but I hope this gives you just a little bit uh, more appreciation of some of the things that we've talked about.